Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and thanks for logging on. We're spending our weekend with watches and everything you see here is for sale. Reach out to me at tmasso at thewatchbox.com. That is my email address to inquire about the price of any watch you see on this show. We are also looking to build inventory. Buy a trade or sell a watch with Watchbox. When you're selling, we pay cash, we pay fast. No upper limit on value paid. We will buy your entire collection outright. We also love to facilitate trades. Oftentimes, we can give you better value on a trade than an outright purchase. So to buy, trade, or sell, reach out to me, T. Maso at thewatchbox.com. All right, kicking off with what remains my favorite green Rolex Submariner. The Hulk launched in 2010 and to my eyes, born perfect. This is a watch, we'll get as close as we can here without spoiling the focus, that represents the best of what Rolex does in the modern era. So you've got a little bit of color, Rolex green, and then you have the solidity of solid end links, solid center links, a thick gauge milled out clasp, and a substantial super case that makes a 40 wear just a little bit larger on the wrist at least visually without actually compromising the fit the way a truly larger case might have now it's true that the current sub has gone all the way up to 41 but this is a 40 and a true 40 it's just got a little bit more wrist presence because Although we rarely mention it, the Rolex Oyster case is more of a tonneau than a round case, and you can see that here. It's also nice and flat, well under 13 millimeters thick. It's flat enough to fit underneath the cuff. Being a Rolex sub, you can wear this with anything right up to and including a tuxedo, if you wear a watch with a tuxedo. On my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, it fits beautifully. It has a fascinating dial. The new green sub is sort of a reboot of the old 2000s era Kermit. So now we've got the black dial and we've got the green bezel but this was the all green, the Hulk, and it had a feature that Rolex played up initially and then maybe downplayed later on for cultural reasons. So they boasted when the watch came out in 2010 that the dial was green gold. As far as I know, nothing about the dial changed. I'm not sure whether it was in order to uh, discourage people from discounting the watch in places where Islamic custom says gold is frowned upon, or maybe it was just that the green gold they used was of an insufficient purity to be called gold. Whatever reason, this beautiful green metallic sunburst dial is as rich as ever, and it has that wonderfully quirky green gold moniker attached to it. I still call it that. As you can see, we have a ceramic insert that contrasts nicely with the dial, since the dial's metallic and the insert is gloss. Turn out the lights and you can see there is no shortage of luminescence. Bezel pearl fully loomed all three hands. The watch has a 48 hour power serve, 300 meter diving depth, a wonderfully slick. 120 click bezel chronometer certified and then inside the clasp this is one of the reasons you would buy a rolex diver over something like a gmt you get this glide lock system so you've got 20 millimeters of incremental adjustment and two millimeter increments so it really allows you to size it down perfectly even if the fit isn't perfect initially it's going to be plus it allows you to shift on the fly if for whatever reason you want to resize your watch in the midst of activity or inactivity so my favorite green sub and next to the smurf it's a dead heat for my favorite sub of all time but this is the 116610 lv lunette vert this is the hulk Let's take a very different look at dive watches. I would have to say that although that is my favorite sub, this is probably my favorite dive watch of any kind. Now, the 5015 version of the 50 Fathoms launched in 2007, but what you see here came 10 years later at Basel World 2017. All matte, satinated titanium. You can see it's a nice subdued look compared to the full polished steel case. And then we have a lovely blue dial that's actually two different blues, and then a blue bezel that's been capped with a cambered sapphire. The cambered sapphire has been a feature of the 50 Fathoms line since the 50th anniversary watch back in 2003. And so, although you can create a ceramic bezel that's fully loomed today, this wonderful cambered sapphire gives you the appearance of a sort of wet bezel, as though you've just emerged from the depths. The fully luminescent dial that is bezel and dial, absolutely blinding at night. You gotta turn down your NVGs if you're using this with night vision goggles. And it's easy to line up that bezel diamond with the minute hand and then easy to time because we have so many five minute calibrations there. It's really a fully calibrated bezel, almost like a 1960s military watch. I love the fully loomed quarter Arabic numerals. High-grade construction, you can see that Blancpain uses uh, hex screws 
and bars to retain the sailcloth straps. That's very secure. That junction is resolute. And you can see that it's only 50.9 millimeters from lug tip to lug tip. So it's actually kind of short across the wrist. And being all sapphire and titanium, it's very light. Now, Blanc Pen describes this as grade 23 titanium, which they liken to grade 5. I'm less familiar with grade 23 than I am with 2 and 5, but I'm going to push the I believe button here. What I can comment upon is the sailcloth. These straps last for a decade or more. There are 5015s from the 2000s still on their original strap. The bottom is lined with rubber. The top is that sailcloth material that is almost indestructible. And then we've got a fold-out clasp here, and you can see it is a double deployant fold-out clasp, and actually it's anchored by a screw, which is about as secure as you can get. A deployant clasp is less likely to be dropped than a pin buckle, and a deployant clasp with a screw is less likely to be dropped since the strap can actually pull out. You can see this is a 50 Fathoms customized strap right here. We'll throw it on my wrist, take a quick look at it. Although it's a lot bigger at face value than the sub. The sub was a 40, this is a 45. The short distance across the wrist means that it's an easy watch to wear even on a smaller wrist. I would happily wear this. And while it's big, you can see the lugs are not quite out to the edge of my wrist, and that's a little bit easier to see down the barrel where you can see they're getting there, but we're not there yet. I would say this watch could wear just fine on a wrist my size. In fact, if you zoom out, you can see I have a tiny wrist, but I don't have a small arm. So the watch actually looks fine proportionally against my hand and my arm. So Given how light it is, I recommend it if your wrist is my size or larger, and you're going to want to wear this watch because there's lots to love. You've got a five-day power reserve. You have an anti-magnetic silicon hairspring. You have an immensely shock-resistant architecture, three mainspring barrels automatically wound, and these are known to run within plus one second, plus one half a second a day. So it runs as well as it looks, and you can see that the bevels here are a mile wide, rounded and beautiful. I realize at some point there must be at least a start by mechanical milling tools, but this is the finest beveling I've seen this side of Laurent Ferrier and Romain Gautier, so truly impressive stuff on a series production watch, and you can see that they have this lovely sort of spiral snailing across the bridges instead of a hackneyed Cote de Genève. It's a much more modern look for a modern watch and a modern movement, and it's free sprung. You've got hacking seconds, a quick set date, once again, that five-day power reserve, which was wonderful because you can put the watch down for a few days and not wind up rewinding it. Let's hear the bezel action. A little bit more damped than the action of the Rolex bezel, which feels more mechanical, but still 120 clicks. You can place it very precisely. And with the double sapphire bezel and crystal, you can really protect yourself from scratches when this is on the wrist. Now, let's say you want something a little bit more vintage evocative. Well, we turn back the clock to the old... Seamaster 2913, the original Seamaster 300, and some versions of it featured what's known as a lollipop second sand. Well, back in 2015, Omega brought that back for the Spectre edition of the Seamaster 300. This came out in 2015, 7,007 pieces, 41 millimeters in steel. True, that's not a particularly limited edition, except by the standards of Omega, and it's hundreds of thousands of watches a year. We do have a few features here on the Spectre that you don't find on the standard Seamaster 300. First, a vintage style 12 calibrated bi-directional bezel and most bi-directional bezels feel rather ropey they don't have a sharp detent this this feels as crisp as a rolex and you can see it's ceramic capped the bi-directional thing is very much a vintage dive watch convention before the iso 6425 that was considered something that dive watches would have you can also see that instead of being conventionally calibrated to 60 it's 0 to 11 on the dial instead of having 12 3 6 and 9 we've got the omega logo up at 12 o'clock and instead of a conventional second sand we've got that vintage big lollipop this is a watch that also features james bond branding on the clasp as well as on the case back including individual numbering. It is 300 meters water resistant. You can see we've got a push button slider there, 9.6 millimeters of incrementally adjustable sizing. And we have a vintage evocative sort of flat link profile bracelet. We'll zoom out a little bit, throw this on the wrist, and you can see it's a little bit more compact 
than the Blanc pan, but not as much as you might think because of the presence of the solid end links here, it's just about as close to the edge of my wrist. So while I'd recommend this watch for wrist as small as 15 centimeters circumference on a strap here on the bracelet, I'm gonna say 16 centimeters like my wrist. You're, you're really gonna want a size of at least that circumference to wear this best. Neither is it particularly thinner than the Blanc pan is. They're pretty similar when they're actually down on the wrist. A good looking watch, it's got tech spec and impressive attention to detail on the back where we have a caliber 8400. This is the Note 8 version of the 8500. COSC chronometer certified, immensely anti-magnetic. You can see it is a master coaxial chronometer. This is just before the master chronometers. Twin barrel, 60 hour power reserve and effectively amagnetic with that 15,000 gauss or higher rating. Full balance bridge with a free sprung balance and we've got the tri-level coaxial which is the most modern version of George Daniels famous invention. Here we have a vintage look case with minimal beveling, squared off lug ends, no crown guards and we have one feature that sets the 8400 apart from for example the 8800 and that's the individually adjustable hour hand for traveling. You don't get that on the more basic single barrel movements so that's a nice upscale feature associated with the twin barrel caliber here. We'll do a quick loom shot, take a look at what the watch looks like in the dark. You can see all three hands loomed, though this not being a true dive watch in the modern sense, it doesn't feature a loomed bezel index. That's a cool watch and a wonderful piece in that by Omega standards, it is fairly rare. The James Bond connection is all subtle. There's nothing on the dial that would give it away as a Bond themed watch. So if you're not into James Bond, the co-branding is subtle, not overt. It won't ruin the watch for you. All right, let's take a look at some special watches from brands that love them some salmon dials. Taking a look at a model that came out in 2018, this was the latest evolution of the Patek Philippe 5270. At the time, this was the arrival of the Platinum model. Previous versions had all been in some variety of gold. And what you really see here is that it came into its own. This is the final and definitive version of the interaction between the date ring and the tachymeter. So the so-called chin has been minimized. We have black and white gold indices, numerals, and hands. A lovely and beautifully balanced salmon dial. It is a perpetual calendar chronograph, which has been a unique signature of Patek Philippe since 1941 when it launched its first modern format series production perpetual calendar chronograph, the 1518. Now the watch is only 12.8 millimeters thick and that's important because I'm going to show you a watch that's very similar in a moment that's a lot thicker. It's a 41 millimeter watch with beautiful stepped lugs that really set this apart from a lot of other watches in the segment. When you flip it over you can see the movement is beautiful. A lot of folks uh, by default, give Langa credit for building the most beautiful series production calibers. But as you're going to see in a moment, this actually holds up quite well. We've got a column wheel that is capped with a black polished steel cap. We've got a clutch that features sharp exterior points where bevels meet. You can really see how impressively finished that is. You can see Cote de Genève across the bridges. We've got perlage in several different sizes on the base plate, black polished screws with chamfered slots and circumference. 65 hour power reserve for a lot of naysayers. Remember modern Patek movements more often than not do hack. And then we've got an overcoil hairspring, a six position adjustment, the watch guaranteed to run no worse than minus three plus two seconds per day. Lateral clutch, of course, for its beauty. We have an instantaneous minute jumper right over here with a pawl and a wheel. And you can see that the action is engaging in more than one sense, pun intended. The column wheel feel and sound, world class. And when I throw this watch on the wrist, by the way, top of Esselton diamond between the lugs, a signature of a modern platinum Patek Philippe watch. It's a big watch. There's no doubt about that. It's a lot larger than its predecessors. And you can see on my wrist, we're pretty much at the limit of what's acceptable. So my 16 centimeter circumference wrist wears it well, and it really will fit underneath the cuff. But you can also see from over the top, that those lugs are right out to the edge. So just be advised, the 5270 is a really large watch. And in platinum form, it's also a fairly massive watch. But as you would hope and expect on a watch of this caliber from a brand of this ilk, we have a full single fold deployment clasp in platinum to keep it secure. Now, I've already teased the next watch and I hope I'm not disappointing you. In fact, I would even go so far as to say we're upping the ante a little bit with Langa. Now, the original Dotograph Perpetual Tourbillon came out in 2016. This was a follow-up for 2019, 100 pieces, and it is really something special. A watch whose movement includes 
729 parts. We'll get a little bit closer here. We're going to start on the back and work our way to the dial. Manual wind caliber, 50-hour power reserve. We talked about column wheels, and we're not in Geneva here, so you can see that the column wheel is not capped, though it is black polished across its top. In fact, you'll be impressed by just how many black polished, that is, diamond finished surfaces there are here. Everything that's turning black as I angle it through the light, that is black polish and you can see why it's called black polish. We have a tourbillon with an overcoil hairspring. It's got a free sprung architecture. It beats weight 18,000 vibrations per hour. It's immensely beautiful. It's also equipped with a rare for tourbillon hacking seconds function. We have here a 50 hour power reserve to 65 on the Patek, and it's been adjusted in five positions, but you can also see that there are longa stylistic traits, including a diamond capstone atop the balance. You see that right there? These rubies are synthetic, but the diamond is real. You can also see we have German silver bridges and plates, everything that's got that sort of light gold hue, that's German silver, nickel copper zinc with the copper giving it the color, and then everything that's silvery white, that's all steel components. Though you can see they're finished to the same standard as both steel and German silver have those same mirrored bevels. Take a look at the clutch. The clutch is impressive. In stainless steel, we have both sharp outward points where bevels converge and sharp inward angles where bevels converge, and that's just on one part, which is made of steel tougher to finish. You can also see other stylistic elements of Langa, including a freehand engraved anchoring point for the cock that mounts the tourbillon. You can also see we have engine turning in several sizes. We have stripes across the bridges. We have golden chaton cup fitting the pivot jewels, and that's another 19th century, early 20th century pocket watch convention that Langa reprises here. Now, we have a dial that is actually made of solid gold. When you see this rose gold color on a Langa dial, it means the dial is actually made of gold. So not just golden hued, but actually precious metal and solid. The watch is also a little bit different from the Patek in that it has an unexpected for a dress complication application of Luminova. Now there's a lot going on. We've got a flyback chronograph which resets and restarts without first stopping. We have a power reserve indicator between 9 and 10. We have a perpetual calendar which you can see here and if you pull the crown out, let's say the watch stops for three days, you pull the crown out and now you make one, two, three adjustments. Note, note the moon phase, note the movement of the day. If necessary, it'll also move the month and the leap year, but this is a quick adjust system. If you fall three days behind, pull the crown out and start toggling. Note that the action doesn't work when the crown is in. That is a self-defense mechanism. You can also see that the moon phase is made of solid white gold. Longa, they make their moon phase discs out of gold. There's a tack meter outboard, giving it a little bit of a sporty air. Now, the watch is 41 1.5 millimeters and about 15 millimeters thick. So this is where the thickness relative to the Patek becomes a bit of a factor. Uh, we'll zoom out a little bit, throw it on my wrist. I've worn this watch several times and I can assure you that the thickness does come across but maybe not as much as you'd expect. You can see that the case back is actually quite extended, but it's inwardly stepped. So once you tighten this so that it fits your wrist, it's still going to be a lot thicker and bulkier than the Patek, but it's not going to be quite as thick as that almost 15 millimeter thickness suggests. But once again, I think 16 centimeters circumference is the lower limit for wearing this well, and that's just down to the lug-to-lug -lug span. Taking a quick look at the buckle, you can see something rarely found on a longer watch. Uh, this is a full deployant clasp, and it's long as more upscale deploying clasp, the one that includes triggers. So you have to press the two triggers to open it. And in recognition of the weight of the watch, there's even a, let's see if I have enough fingernails to do this here, but there's even an internal system that opens up the buckle component of the clasp and you feed the strap through and then you lock it down. It's a better system than using a screw to fix the strap on the buckle because you can move it if you want to without tools. So a lot of security there. This is a four figure piece if you want to buy it, four figures worth of euros. This might be the coolest watch we've got on the show tonight, but I'm going to try to beat it right at the end. I have two very different takes on rose gold perpetual calendars, one from Jorn and one from Patek. Now, what we have to the right is the latest version of the FP Jorn Contiem Perpetuel. It is the model launched in 2013, or at least announced in 2013. It didn't come to market until 2015. And then this new dial that you see here without the little uh, 
let's call it the polished steel football or the frame for the center of the dial. Uh, this came out in 2020, this dial design, where you have the dial unconstrained by that little metal bezel that previously sat between the numerals and the calendar indications. We'll get a little bit closer here. You can see it's a lovely combination of dark blue and rose gold with those wonderful applique numerals rather than printed features. You've got a 120 hour PAL reserve, though in fact the watch will run for about 160 before it stops. 120 is the chrono a metric power reserve during which it keeps best time. Now, Jorn wanted you to be able to adjust his perpetual calendar without use of a stylus or a tool. So you can see that the crown allows me to adjust the day, then I turn it in the other direction, and I adjust the day and the date in sync. Now, you might be wondering, what about the month? Well, that's a good question. Hidden underneath the lug up at about 1.30, we have the mechanism for indexing the month. So everything can be set without the use of a stylus. Now when you flip it over, you can see that this watch is pink on pink. The movement is made of solid gold, automatic winding, free sprung, adjusted in a chronometer style, five positions. It is all rose gold, 18 carat, with the exception of the mass, which is cut on a rose lay, then 22 carat. And uh, this is a nice match between case size and movement size. You can also see some things are improving at Jorn. The bevels are getting better through the years, as we now have a more obviously mirrored and polished profile to the edge of the bridges. They're still started mechanically, but at least a uh, final finish is done with a handheld drill bit with a buffing tool that removes the milling marks and shines up those bevels. We've also got a circular Cote de Genève all the way around. The screw heads are black polished. And a feature I really like, you can see that the locating pegs that help to locate the bridges on the base plate, uh, these little polished steel components, the heads of those pegs have been black polished and rounded here. That's something you see on a lot of high-end watches of superior caliber, and this is certainly one of those. And of course, a perpetual calendar. I keep mentioning perpetual calendars here. These are calendar systems that are able to deal with irregular length months and leap years. And I actually am glad that Jorn didn't try to squeeze some sort of a moon phase onto this dial. That allows an aperture style calendar, which takes up more space, but is also a lot easier to read. You can easily see here, we're looking at Sunday, July 7th, whereas on a pointer style calendar, which is more traditional, uh, it can take a moment to actually figure out what you're looking at, especially if the hands get in the way as they do right here. This is a much thinner, finer, more gracefully styled case than the Jorn. Uh, the Patek Philippe 5327R, this came out at Ball's World in 2016. It was the successor to the old 5140. This is 39 millimeters, and you can see it's under 10 millimeters thick in rose gold. It's standout feet features of the lovely cream lacquer dial, the breguet Arabic numerals, and then these scalloped evacuated lug profiles, which offer peerless elegance. And you can see that the bezel is also concave all the way around to visually thin it out. But we do have those pointer style indications. So coaxial, we have a 24 hour indicator and the day. We have a leap year phase indicator in the month. And then we have the pointer style date and the moon phase. Now this little 24 hour thing, that's just there to let you know when it's night. So for example, if I want to know, am I looking at 6 a.m. or 6 p.m.? Well, you can see the little index is pointing at 18, so I'm looking at 6 p.m. So, for example, if I see this, and I could see that the indicator is down at 10 p.m. I know not to use the pusher adjusters to adjust the calendar. That's why that 24-hour dial is there. Now, one thing I do like here relative to the Jorn, I like this a lot more than the Jorn, is the use of a micro rotor automatic. Because with a micro rotor, you get the thin profile of the manual wind because the winding system and the rotor are in, are in the same plane as the other bridges. But you also get a more open case back. Here you go. Half that movement's always going to be blocked. Whereas here, I can see everything. I appreciate that since I've paid a lot of money for my Patek Philippe. Another thing that I like is that Patek quotes an accuracy rating. And they rate this watch and several others in their collection at no worse than minus three plus two seconds per day. Jorn says this watch is an automatic that can keep chronometer grade time but makes no promises. Here, Patek's a little bit more committed to the notion. Plus, we have an anti-magnetic silicon hairspring, so we have a little bit more resilience for the way people wear their watches today, which is often 
often in the home and office in proximity to powerful electro and static magnets. Think the magnet in your laptop, and you know exactly what I mean. A good looking watch, easy to wear. I think both these watches are very appealing. On paper, they're only one millimeter apart, with this being 39 and the Journe being a 40. But in reality, I find that the Patek wears a lot more compact. So if you've got that smaller wrist, this is going to be the one you're going to want to pick. It's a lovely, enduring beauty. This watch will look just as good in 100 years. There's nothing voguish or faddish or of the moment about this watch. And while that's not always the case with Patek Philippe, it is the kind of stylistic quality that made the brand famous. Now, taking a look at the Journe on my wrist, you can see that the Journe's a great looking watch because I really prefer the combination of the blue and the rose gold, which is a red hot combo. The contrast is fantastic. It's wonderful. It's complimentary. The way those applique numerals really light up on the dial in contrast is magical. And then you could see that the watch is a little bit different in detail and that the Journe does have a pin buckle and the Patek has a full clasp. So on that point, advantage Patek. But I've already been through some of the elements that I like most about these watches. Uh, here you've got a huge amount of power reserve, aperture calendar, a killer color combination, and the watch has the solid gold movement so that when you pick it up, it feels like an enormous brick of precious metal. This is a little bit more gossamer, graceful, refined. Uh, it doesn't have quite the brass knuckle visual impact. It's more of an elegant dial than a punchy one. And of course, you get the value that comes with the deployant clasp and the visibility that comes with the micro rotor. I like them both. I think if I had to pick between them, I would probably go with the Journe for its power reserve and for the ease of reading the calendar. Want to see something cool? It's one of the first 10 de Batoon watches ever made. This is the DB1 chronograph, and it's a piece unique. So 42 millimeters in yellow gold. This is the DB1 as it debuted back in 2002, the first de Batoon timepiece. And this is one of the first 10. It has a mono pusher chronograph system based on the caliber that Denis Flageolet, later of de Batoon, and F.P. Journ, later of Montre Journ, put together for company called THA, a firm they founded and ran through the 90s. The movement was originally designed for customers, including, among others, Cartier, Ulysse Norden, and Franck Muller. So when the movement was repurposed by Denis for his first watch built under his own brand, it was very much like an in-house caliber, as he'd created this mono-pusher oscillating pinion column wheel chronograph. Now, of course, the watch has those famous ogival or torpedo-shaped lug tips. They're still on many modern-day de Batoon watches, most notably the DB25s, but you can find them on the 27s and the 28s as well. Here we have a case and lugs paved with diamonds and blue sapphires, and it is exquisite. It's also subtle. You can see the dial, uh, classically silver-white with blue printing and blue modified breguet hands. Later on, de Batoon watches would become distinctly less classical and more avant-garde. A lot of purists who pine for the earlier days of the brand, the customer caliber days, the round case days. They're into watches like this. Now, the timepiece is 8.8 .8 millimeters thick and 42 in diameter. You can see it features a matching de Batoon pin buckle right here. You throw it on the wrist, it has a very different kind of presence than a modern de Batoon timepiece, even a DB25. If you're the type who likes Laurent Ferrier, Kerry Voudelainen, if you are the type who pines for the early days of Roger Dubuis, the homage, the sympathie, the condottiere, this is very much in that vein. A wonderful way to get into de Batoon and an investment grade watch because, uh, frankly, there are so few of these made, and we're talking dozens of every variant of the DB1 and the DB8 chrono. These are so scarce that if you buy one, you'll probably never see another. And if you buy this one, you're guaranteed to never see another because this was a piece unique. All right, maybe you have less money to spend on your chronograph. That's okay, because in 2016, Omega with the hand up. This is the CK2998 is a Speedmaster that is a lovely and evocative piece. As you can see, a blue ceramic tachymeter. That's all we have, sapphire, domed and cambered, just like you would find on a vintage Speedmaster. You can see this has the look of a CK2998, which would have been a early generation Omega Speedmaster, second generation Speedy. And then, of course, the combination of the alpha hands on the dial. You've got that downwardly stepped track for reading the minutes, seconds, and fractions of seconds. You can see we've got the 
old school first Omega in space case, which is 39.7 millimeters in diameter. It doesn't have the shear guard profiles of the professional. It's also smaller in diameter. The lugs are squared off. We don't have the liar style lugs. Conventional on the case back, you wonder why is there a seahorse on the back of the Speedmaster? And that was always because the Speedmaster started its life in 1957 as part of the water resistant Seamaster family. Individually numbered, we've got a Moonwatch movement inside. It is the 1861 48 hour power reserve. We have a lateral clutch cam system, manual wind, 21 6 beat rate. It is the Moonwatch caliber that flew and continues to fly. And as you can see on the wrist, it's more wearable than a Moonwatch, being shorter lug to lug by a substantial margin. It's about comparable in thickness. So you don't buy this watch because it's thin, but it is easier to wear on a smaller wrist. And if you're a lady looking to get into Speedmasters, this is going to be a more accessible point of entry, especially if you want something that's a little bit more upscale than a Speedy Reduced. This is a great way to get into that. Now, taking a quick look, we'll turn out the lights. You can see that like the gray side of the moon, it's fully loomed, which means you've got the dial loomed, yes, but also the full tachymeter scale luminescent. So a wonderful little touch by Omega. Finally, and this is going to be hard to beat, I know we've got two episodes this weekend, but this might be the watch of the weekend. Uh, launched in 2022 and made in only 20 pieces in grade 5 titanium, this is the H. Moser & C. Endeavor Concept Tourbillon, and it is a lovely combination of Fume Fade, blue enamel, on a hammered style, white gold dial base, with a flying tourbillon that has a 90 hour power reserve and a minute repeater. You can see the case is beautifully rendered. A combination of fluid forms, polish and satin for contrast, only 20 pieces made and the dial solid gold with that hammered style texture and it's a flinke where you have either guilloche or hammering underneath a translucent enamel and it is a, a fume fade from light at the center to dark at the edge in Moser tradition. Now taking a quick look you can see those hammers have been beautifully black polished across their top and beveled on their edge. We have those outward points that I like to talk about where bevels converge and then you flip it over and you can see the legacy of Manufacture Haute Complication, which assisted Moser in developing this repeating caliber. That's one of the reasons why you can see this fantastic level of beveling, unlike anything you'll find on any other Moser watch. This is more like Romain Gautier level finish, and Moser watches, while neatly executed, are not finished like Gautier unless you're talking about this model. You can see the stripes are beautiful with a double crested groove. We have black polished screw heads with chamfered slots and circumference, a golden pivot. You can see a chaton fixed by screws a la pocket watches holding the barrel in place. And then this wonderful tiered step down, a cascading drivetrain from the barrel all the way down to the tourbillon. And you can really see the quality of those bevels there, not just rounded and mirrored and probably finished with gentian wood, but those ultra sharp inward creases, as good as anything you will find in the Vallée de Jeu. And you can see the governor on the reverse side and a movement that is made to be heard. It's an absolute pleasure to actuate since the slide sits on a Teflon runner that gives it a wonderfully silky action. I can't help you understand that action. It has to be felt to be understood. But sensory perception online does extend to sound. You could see that tourbillon, and by the way, you can hear it ticking across a quiet room. Let's have a listen to one of the loudest and most sonorous minute repeaters I have ever experienced. I'll try to get as close as I can to 1259. If you like what you see here, well, there's only this one and 19 others in the world. Reach out to Team Osso at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details.